Lepo pozdravljeni na spletnem pogovoru o zoprstavljanju političnemu umešavanju v delovanje javnih radiotelevizij, ki ga organizirajo Mirovni inštitut, Društvo novinere v Slovenije in Podčrto. Welcome to the online event on the resistance to political interference to the work of public service media and a special welcome to our guests from abroad. Uh, these are Mr. Christian Nissen, former Director General of the Danish Broadcasting Corporation, lecturer and advisor on the subjects of international politics, public administration and media. And Tarmo Tamerk, who is an ombudsman at the Estonian public broadcasting company ERR, also former editor in chief and journalist, also board member of the organization of news ombudsman. Welcome both and welcome everyone actually who joined us. Um, I would like to ask all the participants to remain muted during the initial discussion. There will be enough time for questions, there will be enough time for the debate, for comments in the second part of our event. You can use the chat department, uh, the Zoom's chat department to warn me that you have an interesting question or you can just raise the hand as usually. Um, but let me start with the quote from our colleague from Austrian radio television, ORF, Klaus Unterberger, the head of OR, ORF's public value department, who like to say that regarding public um, uh, service, uh, public media services, there's no swimming in calm water any longer. Regardless of the state the public service media operate in, they face many common or specific problems regarding political pressures. Um, so let me start with the state of affairs in Denmark. And Christian has prepared um, a very short and very informative and also provocative um, PowerPoint presentation. So let's start with Christian in Copenhagen, please. Thank you for inviting me. I have been looking forward to, to uh, this event and uh, I will try now to, uh, I hope you, it functions and you all can see it as I have in presentation worked. Just a moment. Here we have. Uh, I have been invited for many years uh, back in the 1990s and the beginning of this century uh, to many Eastern European countries to talk about this subject here. And that's the reason I underline this question, is Denmark really one of the exceptions? Because for many uh, of many people, who are journalists working in Eastern Europe and also in Southern Europe actually, uh, Denmark is, and the Nordic countries are often considered as some kind of a heaven uh, for free journalism, because we normally doesn't meet government intervention. But it's important, that's the reason I stress it here that Political intervention in public service media takes place also in Denmark. So I can confirm the quote you had from your Austrian colleague that every, all countries uh, experience these kinds of interferences. The general picture when we talk about free media here illustrated by uh, the survey made in 2021 shows your alarming picture. Uh, actually, Europe is one of the parts of the world where there's less interference than in most other countries. But even in Europe, you can see that this, the picture is different between Southern and Eastern and Northern Europe. Some years ago, uh, a British researcher made a specific investigation in interference in public service media. And he looked into 27 European countries and the 10 countries with the highest score of interference are illustrated here. And you can see it's Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, also Portugal, Spain, and Italy. And the 10 with the less, with the low score are here illustrated by the blue dots. It's Northern Europe and also uh, 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 Switzerland and Austria. So, Basically, some of the same features are on the two maps. Uh, public service media is not treated very much different than other medias. Only 
you've had to remi remind that specifically public service media is open for government intervention because governments in one way or the other owns or controls or supervise public service media. And here you have an illustration of the instruments of political interference. It's important to realize that some kind of steering and control are absolutely legitimate. Public service media must be accountable to someone. We would like to, public service media to be accountable to civil society, to the citizens, but the citizens can't uh, uh, have no regulatory power. It must be given upon some kind of political appointed uh, uh, construction. And here you have uh, the, the uh, five normally uh, legally uh, uh, ways of of, of making uh, public service media accountable. Starting on the, on the left side, the board of governors or supervisory board are often appointed by the parliament in one way or the other. It's the board of governors who are, who are engaged in <laughs> staffing, staffing the, uh, the top management. Uh, there's a legislation, performance contracts, there's a public funding, and there is some kind of a regulatory authority overseeing the, what, what the public service media is doing. So it's, it's absolutely legitimate that these instruments are used to, to secure accountability. The problem comes with the next level, what is here is called indirect political interference. And that takes place in almost all of the, uh, the, the, the five elements in level one. Government can intervene in appointing their friends to, to the board. They can intervene in, a, in staffing the top management. They can, for instance, also through the performance contracts or legislation, make some kind of intervention. The public funding is decided by the government or parliament, and the regulatory authority is appointed by the government. The, one of the characteristic things is that if you compare Denmark with most of the Eastern European countries, there's, there's not so much difference when you look at the law itself. The, the text of the law are very similar between Denmark and many of the countries in Eastern Europe, but the political culture is different. So the, the same instrument are used in a different way. The last uh, level here, level three, is direct intervention. And I can say that during my 10 years as Director General of DR, I had, I've had experience with all kinds of indirect political interference and also the di direct intervention. First of all, in general, if you compare Denmark with, for instance, Slovenia, uh, Denmark, uh, the political interference is not a big issue in Denmark. It's not discussed very, very much, although it takes place. The way it takes place, I can give some examples here. The typical thing is that very much of the threats, the hints, the retaliation takes place behind the scene. It's not, but it's seldom that it's taking place in the open. I can illustrate it when, I said here, when the nation goes to war. In 2003, when Denmark prepared to join the intervention in the war in Iraq, uh, I got, not only hints, but directly messages from the government through the chairman of the board that, that, that the DR was considered by the government to be anti-government and anti-war. Uh, and of course, that information was given to me to put pressure on DR to change the journalistic line in covering the war. Uh, the second example here, now and then when being exposed to very critical controversial journalism. When DR, during my years, broadcasted programs criticizing some initiative by the government, and what, uh, I very often uh, got an angry telephone call from a member of the parliament or from a minister, or during meetings, I was drawn to a corner and I really was uh, criticized for what we were doing. An extreme example was, that was after I had left DR, um, the, one of the journalists in DR 
worked through two years on a very critical program on the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, where he documented that uh, the, Danish, uh, uh, the Danish soldiers actually treated their prisoners taken very badly and against international law. That program was undermined through a year by the government spin doctors. The last example here, appointing top management in most of the countries, also in other Nordic countries, also I would say in, in England, appointing top management, especially the director generals, uh, are of course, I would say, influenced by the government. The candidates are usually chosen also uh, considering whether the, the candidates are uh, in one way or another aligned to the, uh, to the government. I myself, I'm the only director general and BR who has been fired. And that was because of some of the resistance. For instance, I was asked by a very central minister in one of the liberal governments in 2003. And he asked me to fire uh, a number of left-wing journalists, journalists who he considered left-wing, even stating the names of the journalists I was supposed to fire. So this, has, this is some of the examples, and I could mention a lot of them. They very seldom come out in the open. Uh, but DR is trying you know, to close the eyes and cover the ears, not to listen to, not to be influenced. The main risk of this kind of intervention is actually the self-censorship, that the pressure put on journalists and editors and the top management to, to follow more the government line. Uh, I would suppose that the harsh reality is that all governments in all countries interfere in media if the stakes are high enough. They do it because of internal instability or external conflicts. That is very well known from the BBC who during the the conflict in, in uh, Ireland uh, was stopped from broadcasting specific programs by the British government. One of the reasons that uh, there are more of these examples today than there was 20 years ago is that we have more unstable political systems all over Europe, also in Western Europe. Uh, the second reason is that the political systems also in democracies have changed in a communicative political culture where the control over media is a very important to, uh, to influence public opinion. The spin doctors, press offices, and so on, it's more and more difficult for Danish journalists to get in contact with the ministers and the politicians. They are always stopped by the press secretariat and so on. So it's, that's some of the main reasons for the picture uh, in the broad um, European scale, it's not only Southern Europe, it's not only Eastern Europe, it's also actually in the Western countries in, in Europe. What to do about it? This is actually the part of my introduction here, which I have the most difficulties by, by making. I would say, if I should give five advices, that considering this influence by government and the risk of self-censorship, it's very, very important with careful, versatile, and fair journalism, not to make a, you know, a, a basis for, for intervention criticism. The second thing is to be precautious and to train. In DNR, we trained actually the journalists how to handle such situations. We trained the editors to make a common culture and a common, a common uh, attitude how we should treat it so they were prepared especially, for instance, in the introduction to the, the, the start-up of the war in Iraq, all news journalists were trained what kind of vocabulary to use, how you know, to give the angle of the news story and so on. Then I would say it's also important to have very close contact between management editors and the journalist union. To get, you know, it, the, the pressure from government must not end at the single individual journalists. It's important that, that the, the public service broadcaster acts unitedly 
and have, you know, support to the journalists who are exposed for criticism. And then I would say, engaging the public media users in civil society is maybe in the long perspective, the most important thing, not only in an acute crisis, you can't, you can't engage civil society in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. It's something you have to do for a longer period of time. And then you have simply to accept that a lot of endurance, that you stay in the battle, that you are you know, united against it. That I could speak more of each, and you're welcome to ask me questions on these elements. But um, I would say thank you for the, the, your attention. Excellent. Thank you, Christian. Um, we have many questions for you, of course, but let's uh, hear from uh, Tarmo now. Um, after Christian was saying, um, he, he also mentioned uh, in many ways the position of uh, Danish national broadcaster, um, but what about the Estonian national broadcaster who is very um, sort of close to us also because of the past experience? I mean, we were both state-run um, uh, uh, public broadcasters for, for decades and we had to go through this transformation in past in the past 30 years. So what's the state of affair, uh, affairs in um, Estonian broadcaster at the moment? Um, as far as I could learn from, from different media, you still enjoy quite high level of public support, which is really nice to hear. Please. Yes, yes yeah. Uh, yes, indeed, it is. Uh, uh, the most uh, trusted media organization in Estonia. And it is really a pleasure to, when you think of, of the uh, difficult past. But I think one reason why uh, it has been possible to transform the Estonian public broadcaster into a truly public broadcaster, not government or state broadcaster, is that uh, some very major reforms have taken early on, right after the breakup of the Soviet Union. Another good uh, impetus came in year 2007, when Estonian public radio and public television were merged into one company. So this created a new opportunity to uh, uh, streamline all the editorial processes to put into the law uh, sec uh, sec uh, secure guarantees for editorial independence. Also, in this uh, process, when public radio and TV emerged, the post of ombudsman was created, which is another element of adding to transparency, accountability, and also the ombudsman can act as a, as a sort of a war, in a way, between the journalists on the one hand and the uh, outside audience on the other hand, including politicians who often are still very critical about public media in this country. The latest survey in Estonia says that 74% uh, of the population uh, have trust in the public media. Uh, this comes after, I think, police rescue services, something like this. So it's very high nationally among the institutions. And then there's a lot of empty space, then come uh, newspapers, and then only then come commercial television. So people in Estonia do not view the public media as, you know, the government thing, but it is the public thing, which is good. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Since you both mentioned um, a sort of criticism that comes from politicians, um, Christian was very specific about it. Um, you were saying also, Tarmo, that uh, politicians sometimes criticize the uh, public media service. Now, I wonder where the most criticism comes from. For instance, when, when, when I did my research on German and Austria um, uh, broadcasters, uh, it appeared that most of um, uh, criticism and also discreditation and um, um, even insults come from um, come from populist and also extremist parties. If we look at the IFD in Germany, if we look at the Freedom Party in Austria, I mean that was the most 
uh, difficult time for both broadcasters. What about in your case? Um, maybe I'll go on with Christian. Um, because uh, Danish television, I mean, it is, um, of course, incredible. It is uh, highly praised in Denmark for its objective news output, for its thought-provoking public debates. But then at the same time, a few years ago, I mean, there was this crisis, mandatory license fee um, was scrapped, 20% uh, budget cut was being made. How did um, what did that have to do with the uh, sort of uh, criticism coming from political parties? Christian. Yes, uh, actually I make a four year research on specific that uh, political media agreement which you mentioned. And the, the sad thing about what happened was it was not only the populist party uh, the Populist Party, which at that time supported a conservative liberal government, participated in it, was actually was also driving the issue of the budget cuts. But it was, it was some very powerful minister in the liberal conservative government who actually were driving the, 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 the whole story through. And I, I, I should also mention uh, when when Sambu uh, noted that the high popular support in Estonia, the same as in the case in Denmark, there's yearly surveys that the news of DR is trusted more than any other uh, radio or television, say more than any other newspaper. The, 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 uh, uh, the citizens of Denmark in yearly surveys, they trust that they support DR to 90%. But uh, the attack made by the liberal conservative government was very close to being supported by the social democratic party. It was not only the right wing or the extreme, the liberal government, the liberal party have been member of Danish government for many, 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 many years. Uh, and it's not, cannot be considered extremist. But the, the, when, when the social democrats were so close to participate in this political agreement, it was partly also because the leading uh, levels of the Social Democratic Party were simply angry. They were mad on DR because DR had had a number of very critical uh, programs. And during my interviews with most of the political politicians participating in this agreement, I interviewed them over a period of three years. I got a very clear picture of how angry they were. And that influenced actually. It, it was not the member of parliament who was responsible for participating in the negotiations. It was actually the top of the political party of the Social Democratic Party. So uh, it's a broader problem actually. And I would say one of the reasons for this is that the political parties who in a 75 or 80 years has supported the whole idea of public broadcasting as a part of developing the welfare society. Mm -hmm. They have simply, if I should mention it, they have lost the political perspective of public service media. They are considering public service media as public railways or the post or any other public service, <clears throat> but the ideology behind it uh, the, the old BBC say to, to uh, inform, to educate, and to entertain, that has been lost. So they are, they are considering public media as, you know, healthcare or any other public service. And the ideology behind it has been lost. Therefore, you can see that whether it's right wing or left wing, uh, the, the distances are not so important. Mm -hmm. uh, here, it's it's that is the most serious thing. That's the most serious threat. It's you can live with an attack or the intervention in a specific issue, but the the general basic support has gradually disappeared in Denmark. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Could you just tell, give us a sort of a brief overview of what actually happened after uh, 2018? Uh, there were uh, a lot of redundancies that had to be made. What actually happened to now the, the um, sort of the plan that license fee is going to be scrapped and it was it was supposed to be replaced by the tax? How much has all this funding debate actually influenced the quality of what Danish journalists are doing at the public um, uh, broadcaster. Yes, let me let me first say that uh, the shift from license fee to tax over the state budget was, of course, criticized by people in media. Anyway, people in, in, in public media. But all political parties supported it. Also the parties standing outside and the initiative, the reason to remove the license fee and to tax finance was explicitly to me during my interviews, expressed simply to get more control. The license fee, you know, is a symbol of civil society ownership. Moving the financial and the budget to the state budget is not only is a symbol of the state taking economic control, it was also expressly mentioned to me during the interviews that it was to get a closer hand on the DR. Um, shortly after the media agreement was decided, we had a parliamentary election and the Liberal Conservative government left office. And we have since then, since 2019, we have had a social democratic minority one party government supported by some of the left-wing parties being outside the government, they decided uh, under pressure from this left-wing supporting parties to, to, low, to lower the, from the 20% to roughly 10 to 12% of the budget. So it was not the whole uh, 20% had to be, to be saved. And there was, yeah, I think, uh, maybe a couple hundred to 150 journalists and other employees were sacked from the DR. A number of programs were closed, a television channel was closed, and so on. But uh, to be honest, it has weakened DR, but not very much. Mm -hmm. DR has been able, you know, to make rearrangement and was in DR was a, prepared to, you know, for this because it was not only rumors, but the plans had actually been openly presented a couple of years before. So DR was prepared and DR had managed you know, to, to uh, rearrange in a way. DR has you know, been through budget cuts for many, many times. Uh, so today, very few are actually observing direct consequences of the budget cut. And to, to my personal opinion, the budget cut was not the most serious about it. It was also clear statements in the political agreement that DR should not broadcast, not make programs which also could be made by private stations. In narrowing, narrowing the, the, the scope of DR's programming to be a very narrow, uh, simply to make DR smaller. Mm -hmm. DR was forced to, to, to close a number of radio and television channels also to make DR smaller. The Minister of Culture publicly expressed that one of the goals of the agreement was to give more space for the market and less space for public media. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Christian. It's good to hear um, what you were saying that <clears throat> DR actually remained strong institution. Actually, what you were saying just now, it reminds me of a situation in Slovenia, because in, in 2005, this really draconian law was expect, accepted in uh, Slovenian parliament. Uh, we call it just by, we, we call it simply Grimm's law, and it limited the autonomy of um, national broadcaster a great deal. And when I interviewed myself later on, a couple of co politicians who came to power after that government who introduced that law, I said, okay, um, now you have to change this law. You have to do everything anew. And basically 
what they were saying was, well, um, yes, but we are not so much in a hurry. We are in power now. So um, <laughs> I, I cannot, uh, but not to agree very fiercely what you were saying earlier. Um, Tarmo, um, what, what about in uh, Estonia? You were saying, of course, we were all saying that um, your broadcasters enjoy strong public support. But as Christian was saying, all over Europe, the basic concept of public service broad, uh, broadcasting is actually crumbling at the moment. Uh, it looks like as if um, uh, the public service media are getting attacks from all directions, not only political directions. If we look at the BBC, they live under strong political strain, but then also the attacks indirect or direct attacks coming from commercial um, um, uh, uh, competitions are equally strong and very harmful. Um, what about in Estonia? You have strong sort of uh, commercial media as well. Um, how is this debate <laughs> developing in your country? Between the uh, commercial media and the public media, there is a, a, a debate, but we could also say there is height. Uh, and height is uh, one sided uh, in the sense of uh, the uh, commercial media have complained to the European Commission uh, that the public media company should not be running the internet operations um, because we are going on the territory of commercial media. Uh, let public media run radio and television and uh, something very briefly in the news section on in online and that's it. So um, this debate is going on now. Of course, the counter argument from the public media and the government in Estonia is that uh, this is no unfair competition to commercial media, as uh, the content that public media offers uh, in its online services very much reflects what is happening in our radio and TV programs anyway. So it would be unfair to cut off in these days, in year 2022, the internet. This is like going back to the whatever ages. Uh, so, but you have to be very uh, uh, competitive uh, as public media has done, making some very clever moves like um, uh, online, offering people noise-free news. Because in commercial portals, you get a lot of noise. Of course, it's advertising, but also content-wise make noise-free news. And there's more and more people who say, I don't want to read the commercial portals anymore. They are more fun, you know, and more, there are more quizzes and stuff like that. But on the other hand, when I go to public media, I get my news immediately. I don't want to get drowned in sort of various non-newsy items there. Uh, the same is true for radio and TV content. Be very specific about uh, aiming directly at your news audience. News is most important for public media, but don't forget entertainment. Uh, and then mix it together in good proportion, news and entertainment. And you get something that people like television, when they go to uh, and watch news at 6.30 in the evening on public TV, um, they can't go away because after that there's infotainment program little bit funny, but also some educational aspect in it. So they don't go to commercial channels. They just stay there until they get another, you know, foreign news thing, then they watch this. You, you, get, you get people involved very deeply. And uh, that's uh, part of the recipe. Mm -hmm. um, what Christian was saying earlier, when, when I asked him about, um, uh, about the impact, the influence of the uh, cuts they had to make in 2018, 2019. Christian was saying that the Danish uh, broadcaster actually restructured quite well and it came out of the crisis um, pretty much intact. Okay, these are maybe strong words, but anyway. Now, what I'm asking you both is, um, it seems that in both your um, of situations, in both broadcasters, you do have this healthy, firm journalistic and managerial team who knows how to fight political and commercial attacks, who responds well, who knows how to defend professionalism 
and knows how to find the arguments of why sometimes, uh, actually all the times, you have to say no to political interference. Um, um, maybe um, um, I, I don't want to now to, um, um, to sort of speak in the name of, of course, a Slovenian national broadcaster, but it seems that with so many people leaving Slovenian uh, national broadcaster in past 20 years, not only because of um, better salaries on commercial media, but also because of this um, a sort of getting getting bored and getting um, a sort of um, um, you can't survive with these waves of political pressures that come from time to time. I mean, it's just um, I mean, these are the reasons why many people left. And sometimes I wonder whether we still sort of hold the ground, you know, that that healthy professional ground that we are supposed to defend. Um, well, the question is, since you are both doing quite well, um, is it always easy to find a professional, uh, firm response to political pressures that, um, um, that you are facing? And how do you do it? I mean, do you create, create United Front? Do you, I don't know, talk a lot among yourselves? I mean, um, um, how is it possible that you remain so firm and stable, you know, against all the odds in this media, European media environment? Um, uh, please, um, our Estonian guest. Well, yes, the political pressure definitely is. Uh, you asked previously what type of uh, uh, parties are the most usual suspects in criticizing public media. It used to be in the past very liberal parties who said, market is a king and private sector can do everything. Public media should be very small. Now, by now, people have realized that public media is actually quite good. Um, and uh, this criticism has disappeared. Now we have populist criticism from the right wing, anti-immigration party, uh, anti-liberal party, who finds fault all the time saying, you must be more conservative. Uh, every time they see a reference to an LGBT uh, event, for example, they say, you're making homo propaganda. This is not legal. You must stop this. It resulted in a member of a supervisory council for public media calling two uh, TV uh, program hosts sodomites. Um, after that, um, uh, he was forced to leave the uh, supervisory council, which shows that um, political pressure from other parties was also on this one particular party. They had to withdraw that member and replace it with another one um, because it was not considered okay to criticize uh, in such uh, sharp language uh, public media journalists for basically doing nothing uh, wrong because um, when you have uh, a segment in an infotainment program about, about uh, the LGBT film festival. This, this clearly is no form of propaganda, as I also concluded in one of my reviews when I received complaints about so-called form of propaganda. What is also good that you have to have um, uh, uh, political allies uh, that when criticism against public media becomes very low and really very brutal, like uh, personal attacks against journalists and so on and so forth. Then you have to have uh, other political parties who are normal in this sense, that who all realize that we cannot uh, start attacking public media in such inhuman terms. Also, you have to have some civil society support, uh, various media NGOs who come out and say, public media is doing the right thing and the politicians should really uh, get their hands off the public media, which happened also when the same populist party two years ago um, made a proposal to the supervisory council to dismiss um, uh, unprofessional journalists from, from the public media. They did not give the full list of unprofessionals, but anyway, they, this is was their official proposal to the supervisory council. 
But again, in the Super Parisian Council, we have uh, all political parties, not only some political parties, as may be the case in some countries, but we have all political parties represented five plus four independent experts. And in this supervisory council, it was also decided that it is not within the mandate of the supervisory council to start you know, analyzing the journalists name by name, who of the, which of them is unprofessional. So of course, this topic was closed and the supervisory council said, it is up to the editor in chief to decide who works professionally. It's up to the ombudsman to point out when a particular journalist is making uh, mistakes in the ethical sense of the word on a regular basis, then the ombudsman must make a proposal to the editor-in-chief. Think, editor-in-chief, whether you want to uh, continue your employment contract with this journalist. This is the way how to work, not via the supervisory council, uh, via political members. Mm -hmm. Okay, it seems that you, uh, you've reached very grown up decision in, in that matter, but tell me something, since you have that uh, sort of uh, also socialist experience, uh, sort of, I mean, uh, of course, Estonia, um, because in many Eastern European countries, but not only in Eastern European countries, um, the way how to conquer the public service uh, media is first you divide them on leftist, and rightists. Uh, then you stick, you know, that labels on every single journalist. And this is how you have very effective tool of how to make pressure on individuals and on the public service. How did you manage to avoid uh, this mechanism of pressure uh, that obviously really works everywhere else? Well, the pressure actually does come from all sides. And sometimes, Journalists at the public media company in Estonia say, also, also the top managers, they say, well, it means that we are okay because we are being attacked from the left and from the right. But when I'm telling them as ombudsman that let's, let's not take such a simplistic view that we can now sit back and relax because we get criticism from the left wing and right wing. Um, but we really have to analyze some of the criticism may be justified. We have had criticism from the liberal parties and the left, more left-wing parties also, when the same already infamously mentioned by me, this uh, populist right-wing party got into government two years ago. And then the liberal parties and liberal viewers of members of the audience started criticizing the public media saying, how can you afford this very populist, this nasty party to to become a member of the government coalition. Your journalists should be doing every day, very critical interviews, very uh, tough work against this party getting into government. But you just interview them as if they were normal people. We have to reply, well, well we cannot take sides here. We at the public media are not forming the next government. And clearly there were some problems with our journalists who let their emotions overboil. In some interviews, some journalists really indicating, yes, I'm interviewing you uh, from this famous uh, populist party now, but I don't really want you to become a member of the government. So they didn't say point blank, but it was too much show, like on television, when you do the interview, something like, and can you tell, you know, body language is wrong and something like that. We had to work with this. We had to admit we were getting too much involved a little bit ourselves too. But um, uh, as a result, because we admitted some of our shortcomings, then the liberal forces who criticize the public media, then they realize there is no need to, to go on with the criticism and not, not to undermine the public media anymore. Because on the other hand, we have the right-wing parties who come and criticize us. So the left-wing has said, okay, they admitted something, we can leave it there because it seems they have learned something. Mm -hmm. Tarmo, thank you. I have another question for you and then I'll open up the discussion and I ask people to raise hands or write to me via chat. Uh, Tarmo, currently, of course, the, uh, the very emotional and um, issue that we are all obsessed with is, of course, um, a Russian attack on Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. Um, you are, of course, um, 
also very close to that situation. You also have um, a reasonably big Russian minority in Estonia. I wonder how does that all affect your work as ombudsman? What kind of letters do you receive at the moment? Uh, what kind of complaint, complaints you maybe receive? I'm asking you because, of course, the war on Ukraine is also one of the uh, pre-election themes here in Slovenia. So this is why it's important and interesting for us. Well, yes, the war is very much on the agenda now. Um, and a lot of the feedback concerns programming policy. Some people at the start of the war wanted to get more news uh, special news programs um, and they wanted the regular programming to be put aside um, and then uh, this this is, isn't something to do for the ombudsman but the ombudsman is accepting this, these letters and, and passing them on to the editors in chief to make their decisions but after I think uh, several weeks we started getting uh, uh, sort of a feedback to the contrary people said I want my, you know, uh, innocent soap opera to be back, but you have Ukraine studio all the time. Um, please give us some regular news because my head is aching and I can't sleep anymore because of the war. And we, we want our routine to continue. So we had a discussion with the various editors in chief uh, and decided that we really need to keep the positive routine going. We cannot cover the war all the time only. Content wise, um, some of the criticism comes from the um, Russian members of the audience. We have Russian TV and Russian radio program as well in the public media, although the bulk of programming is in the Estonian language. Some of the Russian members of the audience complain that um, Russian, the, the Moscow point of view is not represented enough. These are people who uh, used to watch the Kremlin propaganda channels, but they are not available freely anymore in Estonia. So they had to come for the first time in their lives, most probably, to see public media, to watch public media, television in Russian. So it's the, the new members of the audience are difficult to win over because they are so used to the Kremlin, the very one-sided propaganda. Now they just see a tiny bit of it, so a tiny bit of the Russian statements, I mean, the Moscow statements. Uh, some Estonian members of the audience are very critical about any perceived uh, sympathy to uh, Putin. And they see uh, like symbols in when the program host is wearing uh, the uh, Russian uh, trigger, national Russian Federation flag colors. And they say, you know, the, the, the journalist, the anchor is, is showing her sympathy. Well, but there, there were eight colors in the jacket she was wearing. And the three colors were the Russian colors also. But here, if you really want to be very, very, you know, uh, focused on it, you can say, I can see the Russian flag there. So these are in a way like funny complaints, but they show how deeply people take this uh, war situation, which means that, um, Everyone has to be extra careful these days not to offend any sensibilities. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, okay, do we have a question or a comment from any of our participants? Um, I, I can't see just now. Maybe Leah or Brankitsa could help me if they maybe see raised hand or something. No, I just I just noticed that Petra turned on her camera. Maybe she wants to speak. Yes. Uh -huh. okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I can I can start if you uh, if you allow. Um, well, I was wondering, um, uh, Tarmo, when you were talking about um, getting uh, involved, and um, when you were talking about gastrulating and uh, I don't know, to go beyond the line that is uh, the line of being professional, uh, because you also cooperated uh, uh, in Estonia with preparing your code of ethics. I wonder if uh, you have any um, restrictions for journalists. Uh, I think the debate is quite um, 
uh, ongoing in Slovenia as well. How can someone uh, who is journalist, especially on social media, represent his uh, own point of view, for example, and then uh, to, I don't know, divide uh, his or hers professional attitude at the television. Maybe you can tell us something about uh, these lines that are maybe uh, in your code of ethics somehow, or uh, also on the television as well, maybe in particular. Thank you, Petra. This will be a good question for Christian as well. So yes, let's start yes, and then yeah. sure, question. yes, for both of you here. Yeah. Yes, the, uh, the best practice document of the public media uh, concerns this topic. And it's uh, written there that the, uh, the journalist um, must not make uh, his or her personal views to be uh, uh, influencing the, the way that, uh, that, that they are working. Um, and we have to make a very strict difference between genres. In the news, uh, the personal point of view of the journalist does not matter. This is what I'm telling sometimes uh, journalists quite brutally. But no one cares about your opinion. You forget about it. At home, at your kitchen table, you can express your views. If you're working in news, you have to. About your web, what about your Facebook page? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, I was wondering the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your Facebook page. But you, uh, you, you have to uh, act everywhere in the way that you would not be perceived as taking sides. Okay. Uh, and with social media, it is most difficult, of course. It is easier when you, uh, uh, sometimes particular TV channels are being asked to host various uh, public discussions, for example. And when they also uh, uh, express their own point of view, that it may also be detrimental to the work of the news journalist later on. But with social media, it is more complicated as the boundaries between the professional life and, and uh, private life are really uh, not very clear. But still, uh, we have amended our, some of our documents saying that uh, this concerns also the social media. So in the social media, journalists should be aware all the time that everything they do in the personal capacity may have an effect on their professional work and they should make decisions how, how to express themselves. If they express themselves in a, in a real group of friends, it's one matter. But if they go to public uh, Facebook debates and then they say, oh, what a stupid interview I had to conduct today with, with this uh, awful um, chairman of the party. And then the next day she comes on air and says, oh, hello, Mr. Chairman of the party. I have another interview to do. So people will realize this is not serious. Uh, so some, sometimes we have had to point out this to journalists that uh, please think about it. But I do admit it is quite, quite slippery ground and these debates are going on all the time. We do not have a ban on uh, journalists to act in social media in, with their private opinions, but they always have to weigh how much it would affect, it may affect their professional life. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, I personally find uh, very helpful uh, the rule that is obeyed by, uh, he was a uh, European journalist of the year. This is ORF's Armin Wolf. And he was said, once said to me, he was saying, I will never say on public media or in public something that, that I would not say in the program I am presenting. I, I find that a, a sort of a reasonably good rule that not only keeps you safe, but keeps you within within the structure of public media service, I mean, um, and within professional attitude. Um, Christian, what about in Denmark? How did you solve this um, hot issue? I would say uh, the situation in, in, in Denmark and in DR are very much following the lines mentioned by Tamil. Uh, we make at, I mean, it's, it was during my time in DR, we revised the ethical guidelines for journalists. And uh, I, we made a general statement that journalists, and especially journalists in news and documentaries and factual programs, should refrain from any uh, signal attitude of uh, anything that could undermine the credibility 
uh, giving, you know, a picture of they participating or the one side and things like that. And it's very seldom been a problem. There have been during the last 10, 15 years, there have been cases of individual journalists who, for instance, on Facebook, came, you know, with remarks which could undermine their credibility. And that had been, you know, criticized and stopped by, by the editors. So it's very seldom is a problem. Mm -hmm. I would add then, though, that when we regard the populist, the Danish Folks Party, which is the popular party, you know, uh, criticizing uh, refugees and refugee policy and all of that, in the beginning, they were treated as a far out populist right wing party, also by many journalists in DR and in the printed press, for instance, they were not taken serious. So I can understand that many of them basically have been criticized, criti not only uh, criticizing DR, but been very critical toward the press because they were some right. They felt themselves, you know, uh, uh, kept outside of serious journalists. They were not interviewed. When they came to power by being a supporting party to the Liberal Conservative government, that situation changed. I, and, and, and I must admit that during my time in DR, uh, the first five years they were out in the cold. In the last five years of my 10 years period in DR, they came to political power. And gradually, we in DR realized that we had actually been mistreating them. If you take, if you take the Danish drama production, uh, Baldwin, I don't know if you know that, uh, uh, no. of and, and you can see in Baldwin, the first two seasons, there was a special political figure, leader of the Populist Party. Exactly. Uh, who yeah. was, you know, he was he was drawn in a way that you know such some something a man coming from far out you know from from the countryside and so on, uh, and, and he was actually, you know, he was uh, 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 in a way you know drawn as something a little crazy and so on, and and of course the Danish People's Party got very angry, and that you know. That rest actually their, their bad feelings toward me, and they have done, they have they have had some right in that. I must admit that, uh, but but that has changed, uh, and 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 so we don't have actually in Denmark very you know, serious questions. And, and, and so, to my opinion, it has very much to do with journalists being professionals. Journalists who are professionals, they will refrain from coming with personal remarks on Facebook and things like that. And we have supported that professional stance by underlining that it's not acceptable for journalists in news programs and current affairs to intervene themselves publicly in the debate on in their personal uh, opinions. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Christian. Well, first, thank you for Borgen, which was very much enjoyed by Slovenian audience as well. But uh, regarding your second issue about, about professionalism of the people who express opinions on Facebook, I have a specific question about journalists, let's say um, DR journalists or RTV journalists who is express uh, 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 criticism um, of um, for instance, RTV or DR editorial policy on Facebook page or Twitter page. Basically, employees of public broadcaster publicly criticizing the policy of its own employer public broadcasters. Mm -hmm. Now, in my decades of experience, um, of course, you could call that unprofessional, yeah? But uh, on the other hand, it usually happens when other lines of communications within the broadcasters are closed or are not operating um, properly, functionally. When you cannot talk to your boss or to your uh, general manager or someone, look, is our editorial policy okay <laughs> regarding this and that? Well. It happens in Slovenia um, quite a lot um, in recent years. So, so I wonder what's your opinion on that? 
I, I, I would say that in my first three or four years as director general in the 1990s, uh, there was a lot of criticism of what I was doing and what the management in DR, because we make a turn around and changed actually DR more or less completely. Uh, closed some programs, started other programs, and so on and so on. And um, the, the, uh, a group of rather uh, you know, uh, important journalists known by all the public, they expressed uh, criticize, criticism toward the management's behavior in all newspapers in, in, in Denmark. Uh, you know, we, we had a joke uh, in DR at that time uh, said when, when we, the management, have some news we want, you know, to, to, to be sent up to everybody in Denmark, we should make a stamp on it and say secret. And then we should place that paper on a, you know, a copy machine or something that then you could be absolutely sure that it would be exposed for everybody. If we want something to be kept absolutely secret, we should take the paper and the text and go down to the newsroom and radio or television and say, we want this to be printed or to, to be you know, broadcasted. And that would become an absolute secret. During these three or four years, there were really very hard fighting also between me as manager and the unions. But that changed actually uh, but after three or four or five years. And of course, now and then there are journalists you know, many program people are, I would say, they consider themselves as artists, very special people, and they are, you know, used to have a public, and they're used to express their opinion, and they're used to criticize their bosses, their editors, and so on. And I, to an extent, you have to live with it. Uh, and of course, you can, you can try to, to, to handle it by being open. And uh, uh, the years where I was fighting with the unions stopped. And actually the last five years, uh, we had a very good cooperation. And, and actually I, uh, they came to love me, especially when I was fired. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I would say to, to director generals, if you feel yourself mistreated by the unions, you should bring yourself in a situation where the government fires you, then you'll be very popular. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I'm looking <clears throat> for some raised hands or some, um, or some messages in chat. I can't see anything at the moment. So let me go on with my line of questioning in hope we will have some interaction with our audience. Um, now, I wonder, you, you both have years and years uh, of uh, journalistic or managerial experience. How, how do you deal with people that not only in public media, but maybe also in their editorial or journalistic approaches show their inclination towards a certain political party or certain ideological line. I mean, does that ever happen in Danish television? I, I'm not sure if this, it could be, I don't know. You, you had contentious issues with refugees, with uh, ecological issues. Uh, you had um, uh, um, the People's Party experience. So. Um, how do you deal with that? And I also I wonder what kind of what was the attitude of other journalists and journalistic colleagues toward such person? This is a question for both of you. Maybe uh, maybe Tad, will you start now? You're talking of journalists who have uh, the political uh, inclination shown so much. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But you could sense it. I mean, you know. Hopefully you are such good national broadcaster that that was not totally evident, but let's say you could sense it, yes. Um, well, clearly in the news programs, uh, uh, it uh, only happens with the anchors, not with these stories and with the reporters. With the anchors sometimes, because you, you, can, you can see it so much more with the anchors. Uh, the reporter can, can do the story, and then the editor 
can cut something out, which is too much, you know, showing inclination or whatever. But uh, when you are the anchor, as I already showed you, but when you take a position like this uh, in the studio, then people immediately can realize this journalist hates the politician who, who is interviewing at the moment. Or with another person, if you're just being too mellow and soft, then you know, something like you turn your head in a strange way every time you talk with this person. You know, this is something uh, to do with professionalism. There is a special person uh, for this at the public media company who is following uh, the main news programs all the time and who is uh, getting uh, uh, recommendations and uh, notes and remarks from the editor in chief or from the ombudsman and, and then is then working with a particular TV journalist who is too much. Um, inclined to show the uh, political sympathies or something. When it's more serious, like uh, the, a person really is politically very active, then sooner or later, this person will find a place somewhere else. But do you- In but, politics, I, going in to private. politics himself or herself, mm -hmm. or the editor-in-chief is uh, pointing out, or the ombudsman is pointing out, listen, you're getting too one-sided here. This is your fifth commentary. Yes, the commentary section is, of course, opinion is free. Earlier, uh, a colleague of yours asked about, uh, you know, uh, what to do with with, uh, with uh, situation when journalist is expressing personal views. In the opinion section, it's possible. We have like on public radio uh, journalist commentaries, which are uh, personal points of view but based on facts, not simply just I like this, I don't like this, but you must be based on facts. If a journalist is making uh, a fifth commentary in a row, you know, uh, embracing one political view and, and rejecting another political view, then finally we have to talk to this person and say, well, are you really trying to give your listeners a picture of political life or you're just showing your views here? And they leave, sometimes they leave themselves, sometimes the editor in chief says, you're no good anymore for this. Usually they go to politics or sometimes to PR. Do you have many examples like that, that, that journalists of uh, ERR would actually leave uh, the journalism and they would candidate for a certain political party? Do you have many examples like that? Not many, but it has happened. It has happened with the um, uh, before elections sometimes that some journalists really then feel that they have uh, a deep sympathy for one party. And also because radio, particularly TV journalists, are famous people usually, then political parties are looking for new candidates, new faces. And then sometimes journalists come to me uh, asking for advice saying, listen, I've been asked to run as candidate for this party. What do you think? And I'm saying, if you run for candidate, then we have our pre-election rules. 40 days before elections, we pass every time we pass a set of very concrete guidelines. And one point is there that when you are a candidate, you no longer can be a journalist. Uh, but until after elections, they say, if I, if I don't get elected, then I'm saying the door is closed. You can't open it anymore. So think carefully. If you want, then go but you can't come back here. Mm -hmm. Some people come back the day after elections, knocking on the door and saying, I want to be back. Well, it was just, you know, I, I don't know what happened to me because I did this, but they can't come back. It's not too many, but it does happen occasionally. Okay. May I, Xenia, may I just interrupt not to go further, just for me, a second for Tarmo. What about, uh, you anticipated the chief editor will talk to a journalist. What if chief editor is inclined to certain, uh, does this happen to you, to certain political group or view? Um, I can't imagine this. It's, uh, then, it, then something would be very wrong. Uh, it, it could happen with a journalist, with a, like a new reporter who is coming to house and who uh, says that they want to be a reporter, then we find out that actually there's a very strong politician in this person. 
but the editors in chief have been confirmed by the uh, board of directors and they have been found, uh, you know, via a public contest or something. So clearly this has not happened in my term as ombudsman that we have an editor in chief who said, who really doesn't want to get, get involved because they have a sympathy. They may have a private sympathies, but they are very good in keeping it at home. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we have a question from Zoran Medved. So Zoran, please. Senia, thank you. I have uh, two questions for Christian actually, because uh, I like to refer to two points from his introduction uh, at the start of this meeting. And um, he told um, when he uh, talked about the exceptions of media freedom and decreasing of media freedom in, in, in some periods, uh, he told that uh, sometimes public service media are exposed to very critical and in the same time controversial type of journalism. I like to ask um, uh, what uh, do you think that it is the, uh, let's say the, criticism coming from the uh, asymmetric uh, right-wing radical media ecosystem, maybe designed in the, some part of society, like in the United States, we know the, that type of the journalism, right-wing journalism from the United States, when Daily Caller has some very marginalized uh, web media started to produce fake news, and then it was the actually the uh, put it the United States in the conflict of the uh, of the future of democracy in, in this country uh, for next decades. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, I cannot imagine uh, 100,000 Tucker Carlson's in Slovenia, for example, but I don't know if uh, unstable political systems across Europe can provide that kind of journalism and political support to that kind of journalism also in the uh, stronger democracies than Slovenian is at the moment. And uh, that is my question, what kind of controversial journalism you think? Uh, and uh, another point, how to engage uh, public service media users and civil society, for example, in ruling public service media, uh, to, to have more influence uh, in governing uh, public service uh, media. Uh, we have in Slovenia mm, the majority of the people and also political parties who think that we need representative model of governing of public service media, but uh, we are not thinking about the liberative model, for example, on the other side. We don't think about any of modernization of the management of public service media. And I think that this is uh, something uh, what uh, Scandinavian countries uh, had done already, and they have no problems with uh, this kind of management. We have a lot of problems how to pr uh, prevent political interfering in the management and governing of public service media. Tarmo told uh, before, for example, that supervisory council in Estonia uh, 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 doesn't talk about the particular names of journalists or their programs, uh, and that, that is the matter and the responsibility of the managing editors, of course. But in Slovenia, we have the programming council, which is talking from session to session about the names of uh, journalists and their programs and particular words, sentences, you know, that is something uh, uh, really uh, crazy. And maybe the third point, uh, you know, confrontation with journalistic unions and other unions inside public service media organization. Uh, I think that in Slovenia, former director generals uh, supported the wrong trade unions inside RTV Slovenia. And they had been very traditionally against journalist uh, unions in, in, in our house. And that was one of the problems uh, because some of unions present at the moment on RTV Slovenia are allies of some ruling political parties in Slovenia also. And we have the, uh, we, we actually imported some external problem or external dif differences in political views in inside organization. And we have now 
all these problems in the house, not only outside in the environment who is judging public service media in Slovenia. How we can, have we any precise tools to resolve that problems? Thank you. Yes, <clears throat> it was three very important questions and uh, I will try to answer them briefly. The first one about the external criticism towards DR uh, from the printed press. I could say that the political media agreement, uh, which was mentioned earlier from 2018, was orchestrated by a bombardment from the printed press. Uh, the printed press simply wanted DR to be cut down, to be DR to stop having the news uh, on the internet. He asked would go back, as uh, Tamu mentioned, to make radio and television and so on. So the whole printed press was against the art. And criticizing, you know, finding old stories about mismanagement and <coughs> <coughs> criticizing individual journalists. And that period was very, very difficult, not only for the DR management, but also for the DR employees. Simply, Every morning they opened a newspaper, there were a news story and a news story and a news story. That was very, very professionally orchestrated by the printed press uh, uh, organization. And that was simply deliberately to, to weaken DR, to prepare the ground for the political interference in the political media agreement. The second one, about how to engage civil society. I'm, I'm sorry to say, I really don't know how to do it. Uh, when I came to DR in 1994, there was a whole uh, parallel organization uh, with representatives from different civil society organizations. And actually, I must admit, that I deliberately worked to reduce the influence because they were, you know, there were a number of, there was a special Christian organization uh, who argued and fought for having more programs from churches and more programs on religion. There was another organization, civil society organization, who was a part of the labor movement. And they were not representing the ordinary listener and viewer. They were representing very specific interests. Uh, but I, I, after having, I worked for reducing the influence and I succeeded in that, but I lost something else. I was not able to find a relevant, relevant representatives from the civil society. And this is, this is not only a problem for public service media in, in Denmark, and in many other Western European countries, our society, the welfare society, was to a large extent built upon strong civil society. That has gradually disappeared. The political parties in Denmark have been smaller and smaller and smaller, fewer and fewer members. The other large civil society organizations has also more or less disappeared. And that is something which we have not in Denmark found a solution to the problem. So in many ways, DR is, you know, flying around over the society with, without roots to popular organizations. And that is, as I mentioned, not only a problem for public service media, it's a general problem in the Danish society. Uh, the present management in DR ha has for some years now, a couple of, I think, Every once every year, the management top is traveling around in Denmark and having meetings, inviting local organizations, people, and so on to come to a meeting where they discuss DR's programming and DR's affairs. And that is, of course, one thing to do. I think they are actually doing to, to, to do more on that front, simply to find ways also DR has. Uh, nine local radio stations around in Denmark. So, they are, so around them, they're also gathering people, trying to find local support and the debate. The third 
the third question you asked me about the confrontation with the unions. Uh, when I came to DR, one of the reasons we had the conflict with the unions I mentioned earlier was that the unions had a very, very strong position uh, around the beginning of the 90s. They could actually make, uh, 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 as we call it, a, a black screen on television. If they were unsatisfied with something, they simply stopped the broadcast. Uh, and that was something you know, developed during the time of DR monopoly. When there was no other television station than DR or radio station, then making a black screen was really a catastrophe. When we had uh, other television station, that gradually lost its importance. And um, uh, I would say that the break in the in the conflict I had with the with the unions, and that was not only journalist union, that was all the unions, was actually when we had, uh, I think, in the middle of my ten year period, we made a new strategy, which was you know combined with merging radio and television, combined with DR moving to a new headquarter, and that at that. In that project, we invited the unions to participate right from the beginning. So we, we made, I think it was about 10 working groups with um, not only representatives of the unions, but people suggested by the unions. And what surprised me was actually that these 10 working groups came up with ideas and suggestions much, much more radical than the ones I had planned for. And, and that, that actually changed the whole situation because the unions and the, the, some of the uh, people the union suggested to participate was actually, you know, uh, high, highly profiled journalists or technicians and so on. And they actually got the ownership. That was the important thing that the unions and core staff members felt that now they had ownership to the changes. So a lot of the conflicts we had had in the previous work simply disappeared. I was then add to the examples uh, uh, mentioned by Tanu that, that journalists in, 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 in DR uh, who are, <coughs> as I said earlier, very seldom journalists nowadays express their personal points of view. If they do, and if they make mistakes in a news program or in a uh, current affairs program, I, uh, I, 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 the big problem in my time was if the, the uh, editors or sometimes myself didn't intervene quickly enough, if some of the politicians complain publicly over the way they were treated in a news program, then it was very difficult for the management to criticize these journalists. We had generally, it was so that if a member, a journalist in DR was criticized, the management would support her or him. So it was important for us in the management and also the editorial management to be very quick and intervene and take that journalist out and inside the house, not publicly, but inside the house, make it clear this was an unacceptable uh, way of working. And I could say there was, there was a joke in DR that if a journalist in DR was publicly criticized by, for instance, a minister or member of parliament, that was a kind of life insurance for that journalist because if he or she had been criticized publicly by a politician, DR could not do anything against him or her. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, now we are reaching the, the point of um, 1530, where, where, when we are supposed to uh, sort of um, end up our discussion. But um, Tarmo, you have to answer the, the questions that um, uh, Mr. Medved uh, stated. And I have to ask you all, um, now it's the time when we become brief because we have to respect that hour and a half. 
Tarmu, please. Yes. Yeah. And then Mr. Kadons. Yes. The um, uh, two points. One is about the uh, involvement of civil society. It is a complicated thing, but in this country, in Estonia, we have a uh, supervisory, uh, uh, like, a, sorry, a supervisory, advisory, public advisory council, which is made up of various civil society organizations. Um, and they, as the name suggests, they give advice to public media, which means we have a regular contact with various NGOs. There's about uh, 25 members in this uh, public advisory council. Uh, their role is not very huge, of course. Uh, they just give advice. They meet uh, three times a year. And then the short memo is prepared, and this is passed on to the management and editors in chief. And we get ideas from that. And it's a good way of getting direct feedback from various NGOs. Mm -hmm. um, the other point is about the model of oversight over the editorial side. Who is really responsible for what, when journalists are making mistakes? And who is a right, has a right to criticize and interfere? The models are different. As I understand in Slovenia, the, the um, uh, supervisory council on programming can discuss these things, but really it wouldn't make sense to me if uh, politicians uh, and politically appointed members take on journalists by name and by sentence. Um, I think a, a better model is this, that uh, the supervisory council is dealing with financing, of course, and with general programming. How many programs do you have? Two TV stations and four, four radio stations. You have uh, online portals in three languages, you know, something like this. Uh, some other bigger programming decisions are being taken by supervisory council. But we have a board of directors, five people, chairman of the board, one member responsible for radio, another for TV, another for online. Uh, and then every channel has editor in chief. This is a level of editors in chief, and then the board of directors who discusses uh, the uh, various complaints that come in. And also they discuss then every journalist if necessary. Uh, the ombudsman is making proposals about which programs to analyze, which journalist work is um, you know, getting the most, uh, the biggest number of complaints and what is the reason for it. So this is a level where to discuss the you know, individual journalist work and individual program work. But if, we, if you do it in the supervisory council with political members, then it will go on and on that political pressure is felt too much within the public media organization. So if you can think of, uh, of improving the model, reforming the model, I think it would help. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, Igor Kaduns, former uh, Director General of Slovenia National Broadcaster. Uh, Igor, the, it is your time, please. Thank you, very useful discussion. But I think that we must express at this moment that, that today, this time, we have inquisition process, for instance, in RTV Slovenia, where the committee of the programming board are discussing why the TV Slovenia didn't report about the GOLOP provision, which was not provision, but uh, shares. And uh, like the CEO of Planet TV, this is reality here in Slovenia at that time. So it is really urgent that we put together all the strength to be opposed, opposite about these things. I also came today from the court uh, with the existing uh, Grach, and today he was testimony that he have no experience to lead not one people, that the only experience has to be three, less than three year member of the supervisory board, but there was no journalist to report about this. We are not uh, care about what's really happened, how to show the capability of these people who are now trying to rule the RTV Slovenia. We, uh, we also see, can see 
now because it's repeated that uh, member of the programming board, uh, Slavko Kmetic said, we are 21 member of uh, programming board like one. So you, they prepare to the meetings in advance so they can do democratically whatever they want. And uh, that's the reason we must organize ourselves to prevent this situation. I'm not speaking about some political interest because I, in four years, I was twice tried to be changed from twice to, to different political party. And uh, I'm glad to hear that in Denmark also have problems to, to find the support in the political parties because I have must be brief, I will finish here, but I think that we have a lot to discuss in our uh, place a lot because we must see what we can do, not just, just to react. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaduns. Uh, former general director was actually speaking about realities that we find ourselves in, in this present situation. Um, so I will ask our dear guests, Tarmo and Christian, um, I will ask you to sum up actually our discussion um, uh, with, with, with the words on, uh, if you would have to point out one important thing that would help us stop political interference in the, um, in the programming of national broadcasters, what would you say it's the main point? Thank you. And after this, we will uh, we will close our discussion. If I should if I should begin answering, I would say that if I should mention, I will mention two things, or a suggestion and a question. The first, the, one of the dangers of attacks uh, RTV is having now is actually that the individual journalists became insecure of their status, of their job, of their professionalism. So that's the reason I, in my presentation, stressed that management has to unite uh, the journalists or the employees so they get, you know, a feeling of we are a family, we are one company, and attacks in one corner is attack on the whole. So uh, together, the employees and, and, and give them the feeling that you are together in this fight. Mm. That, that would say that might be the most but important Christian, thing. the management is an uh, ally of the ruling the party. They're appointed by... You by know, the they are against these professional journalists. This is the problem also. That, that, that makes it a bit more controversial, I admit. Then you have to go a level down and find a level of management who could do that, but that's, of course, dangerous. The question I have is, um, what about the EBU? There had been a number of occasions where members of EBU has been in the same situation that the RTV are now, uh, and the EBU has acted uh, and also contacted the European Union, the European Parliament, and so on. Have, have you done anything in that direction to, to, to get support? And yes. before I finish, I would say you are welcome to take my presentation and put it on the server when you are the, the link to it so that participants who maybe didn't uh, uh, read all the details can, can see it uh, afterwards. Thank you so much, Christian. There were many paths that have been already taken and there are still many that we still have to go through. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your advice. And uh, Tarmu, are you still with us? Yes, yeah. The um, my final words would uh, would be that uh, uh, we discussed previously how it has been possible for a state broadcaster to become uh, so popular among the audience, and political pressure has become smaller than it was uh, in the early days of public media. And one clear reason for this is uh, the new model that we introduced when we merged public radio and TV. Uh, which I just described, that the supervisory council, which includes political party members, uh, does not get involved in the day-to-day -day analysis of the work of public media. 
clearly this has helped uh, put political pressure away, more away from the public media company. Also, the uh, creation of the post of Ombudsman has helped because when the chairman of the board now gets a complaint from a political party, he responds by saying, thank you for your complaint. I will forward it to the Ombudsman and we will discuss his findings in the board and we will let you know. Previously, it was that the chairman of the board had to protect uh, the media company and had to protect the journalist as, as uh, Christian was just uh, describing what is uh, was happening in his time in, in DR. Um, and then, you know, the political fight was on all the time between the chairman of the board, editor-in-chief on the one hand, and politicians on the other. Now, there's someone else, the Ombudsman Institution, who takes reports to the supervisory council, and then this is the time, two times a year, when the political members of the supervisory <clears throat> council can really start discussing, you know, little details. This is a field day. They feel, oh, we can now say something. But uh, it's the editor-in-chief there, uh, it's the management board there, uh, so if you can keep political pressure in your model out from getting its fingers too much in a pie, this would help. But it takes some time, but I wish you success in this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tarmo. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, everyone who joined us today in this online event on the resistance to political interference to the work of public uh, service media. Um, Thank you. I believe this is not our last, our last meeting, our last discussion. Uh, many people think that um, um, that the main, the main battle actually only begins for the future of our public service broadcaster. Thank you so much, everyone, and Thank have you. a nice day. Thank you.